Good afternoon. I'm here with Michael Carroll, author of Awake at Work, The Mindful Leader, and his upcoming book, Fearless at Work. Fearlessness at Work? Fearless at Work. Fearless at Work. And when does that come out? Uh, in September. September. 2012. September 2012. So uh, we are here today to actually have a conversation about work. How can we actually bring our meditation practice off the cushion and into this very potent, uh, very juicy element of our life, our nine to five, our office life, our career aspirations, whatever that might be. And as you may know already, this is a monthly theme. So this month we're doing work. Next month we're actually doing social action. We'll have Michael Stone uh, do a short teaching as well. So Michael, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with all of us about this um, sure. important dialogue about how young people in particular can really bring meditation into the office. I'm wondering, just off the bat, what tips you might have for people who are trying to bring meditation to their time. I think that the first tip is to practice. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think a regular practice is key, right? So it doesn't have to be in, in, you know, two hours a day or anything, though, if you have that time, it's great. But a regular uh, practice, particularly in the morning, I encourage morning, but, you know, do it at night as well. Uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, so that the development of this sense of poise, presence, be, begins to become uh, sort of ordinary rather than extraordinary, I think is, is sort of my main piece of advice. <clears throat> but then how that unfolds in the workplace is, uh, you know, there's many dynamics to it. You know, I think a lot of times people think of meditation as a very passive thing, it's you on your cushion working with your mind. So when we talk about bringing it into the dynamic of working with others, I'm wondering what yeah. advice you might have. Well, I think it unfolds, right? So the, the, the practice unfolds very, almost predictably, you know? So if you do the practice regularly, the first thing that begins to occur is self-awareness, right? That you're actually aware of your impact on other, uh, which in some cases could be clumsy. You know, you're a little more self-conscious, but at least one begins to sort of regulate how we're impacting one another. Uh, there's a particular set of shifts that occur along the way. One is, I think, an important shift, is typically we're really not engaging the other person. We're engaging our version of that person. You know? uh, we engage our boss who we may like or dislike. And we, engage our colleagues because they have something to give us and deliver us. And we see people through this lens of our version of them rather than actually who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, when we begin to bring the practice to the, the workplace, we begin to actually relate to people authentically, openly, on their terms. Uh, and that changes the dynamic uh, and actually is uh, more refreshing and also more demanding. Mm -hmm. So that would be one element of it. That's great. Yeah. And you know, I get a question a lot myself of, you know, what do you do with a difficult person at work? How can you work with that person? Yeah, I think typically what happens is when we feel insulted or, or sort of uh, threatened, and there are some pretty toxic people, uh, but just the ordinary sense of feeling insulted by another person. We begin to see it through the lens of feeling impoverished or diminished. And that begins to amplify the insult. So the practice begins to teach us how to drop this lens and to actually look through the insult as a window into the other person, with no aggression. And more often than not, I've found that a lot of conflicts in work is because we are emotionally amplifying the threat and not really engaging it with a sense of wisdom and, and really gentleness, openness. And typically, it's not as bad as we think it is. We think it is. You know? uh, and it's far more workable uh, than we think it is. And uh, so, yeah, I think being able to lean toward the insult rather than back and amplify it is, is takes courage, openness, skill. Yeah, leaning in, it's easier said than done. That's great. Right? <laughs> yeah. But it is a gesture. Uh -huh. It is right there all the time. Yeah. It, it's a simple gesture, 
but it, 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 it can hurt. <laughs> it can hurt. One thing I've been noticing, particularly when I am at universities and doing talks there, is that a lot of people are taking longer to figure out what they want to do with their life, specifically around their career. Yeah. Um, not as much direction. And I think there's actually really um, sort of a sad state with this current economy that it's, we're a generation that we're, that's been raised for the idea of you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. And then you graduate from college or get a master's or whatever, and it's not always the case anymore. So there's a sense of disheartenment. I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who are still trying to figure out how to deal with disheartenment, how, how to figure out what they're going to do with sure. their career, anything like that. Yeah, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, really recognizing this, what I would call the, the speed of impoverishment. In many respects, when I go to campus, and I get to go to campuses often as well, um, there's this uh, siege mentality right? where education is something you try to get through rather than actually experience. And it actually is based on kind of an impoverishment that if I could only get this, then this other thing will make me something. You know, and it really speaks to a sense that I'm not adequate, I'm not good enough. I I can't really master my life uh, because life is is sort of coming at me. You know, and that's kind of really disheartening and sad because when I went to college, I studied theology, and I got to study what I wanted to study, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. My parents were very kind to me to, to send me to college and I studied what I wanted to study and become an engineer and everything. So I was fortunate and I, and I find it that it's not an enriching experience for people, it's more of a threat. Um, so I think that's the first thing is, is through the practice, we can actually engage our experience with education or work or relationships and all the things that you speak about. We can, we can engage them from a fearless place. We can actually enjoy our lives. And I think if the students nowadays just enjoy their education, that sense of delight is very magnetizing. And uh, I'm a big believer in the melody of circumstance. <laughs> and and yeah. how it unfolds and invites and uh, opportunities arise. It's the nature of life. So I just think ambition is healthy when it's driven from a place of enriching that we're what I call fearlessly abundant versus you know impoverished and fearful. Am I going to get a job? What am I going to do? That kind of uh, fear-based relationship with education. And uh, livelihood really uh, is uh, invariably authors the very demise that you're trying to avoid. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah. I love that that you actually have to come from that place of the body. Yeah. So it's just fear is scary. Yeah, yeah, it's great advice. Anything else that you feel like um, you would like to talk about in terms of sharing this practice of joining meditation and, and work um, for for young people yeah. kind of thing. Um, well, it's tough, you know. You know, I have a young son too, and uh, you know, it, it's tough to be able to marry one's sort of creative vision. You know, New York's tough, particularly. I, I know when I grew up here, many of my friends were actors and dancers and writers and artists. And you know better than I do that this is an unforgiving city. <laughs> you know, for every one artist that was able to get an acting job, there were, you know. 14,000 who are waiting tables, you know, so you know, I, I'm, you know, I've always had a sort of a, a soft part of my heart for particularly young people who want to be artists and have how difficult it is in this kind of economy. Uh, but, you know, I think the issue really from the point of view of practice is to really understand the nature of mind. And if one does the practice not from the point of view of, of trying to achieve something or get somewhere, but how to actually be who we are completely and understand the nature of mind and gain some confidence in that experience. 
all of these challenges become far more playful and, and far more creative and less a threat. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know everyone appreciates that. Sure. It's really quite valuable teachings. It's incredibly applicable to my life and I'm sure to everyone else's who will be on this site. Uh, so there is recommended reading for this month. Uh, not surprisingly, two of the books are Awake at Work and The Mindful Leader. So uh, feel free to check those out. And uh, Michael, will you, will you come back to the site sometime and sort of answer people's sure. questions? Oh, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm very open to that. So if people want to ask questions and stuff, I love uh, the conversation. So I'm very open to that. Great. Well, thank you so much.